tell that story in a long time because it's, it's quite an old story. I'm just relieving and just seeing your walk interpreted. It, there's just something about it that's really powerful. And, and I thought it was done with such heart. And I thank you. And it's lovely to be here. I want to say thank you to the um, to Jonathan and to the provost for the just really lovely remarks. And also to a woman I love dearly, um, Dr. Eunice Saleh, who is brilliant and wise. And I think the school is very lucky to have her. <laughs> Because I, I like to say that I was feminist before I knew what the word meant. And, and what she said about my friend calling me feminist at 14, he didn't mean it in a good way. <laughs> and, and at the time, I did not know that word. And so we were having an argument, as we did very often <laughs> at that age. And, and I really don't remember what it was, but I was arguing fiercely, and he said, you're a feminist. And I, of course, being a bit of a know-it-all, didn't want him to know I didn't know, so I just kept arguing. And then later I looked it up and I thought, yes, it's exactly what I am. But even then, <laughs> but even then I remember thinking, well, why isn't everyone? I mean, I, I kind of remember thinking, no, I don't mean, I mean, people who, because I grew up on a university campus, people who were ostensibly forward-looking, who cared about justice, that sort of thing. And I remember thinking, you know, People very quickly carry the label pro-democracy activist, carry the label, um, you know, the fight for the equal rights for people. And then I'm thinking, why aren't they all carrying the label feminist? Because it seemed to me that that too was about justice. And that's how I've always looked at it. I, I don't think I, I had a particular light bulb going off moment. I think I've talked to women who have had that. But I, I really don't remember a time when I, I, when I wasn't bristling and resentful <laughs> oh, of, all the, of all the small exclusions and indignities that came with being born female. I mean, I, I think when I was six, which is quite young, even then I knew. I knew, for example, that I couldn't break the color knot. Breaking the color knot is a very... Um, significant part of Igbo cosmology. It's, it's this ritual that you do when you, when it, it's part of everything really in Igbo life. You welcome guests, you break the kola knot. It's a way of saying you're welcome. You're having a ceremony, the kola knot is presented. And if you're female, you cannot break the kola knot. And, and which is interesting because when a group of women, adult women are gathered and they want to have the kola knot presented, they have to go find a boy. And I remember as a child being in my hometown and my aunties had gathered, you know, fierce, strong women, strong voices and just really women who were doing things in the world. But then they went and brought my cousin, who was maybe four, mm. oh. because he was a boy so that he could bless the color not. And even then as a child, I just remember thinking, there's so much that is ridiculous about this. <laughs> and, then, and then we would go to my hometown and they would say, Children are playing, and then there's the other thing, masquerades, and it was just this lovely thing children enjoyed looking at masquerades, and then they would say, oh, the really big masquerade is coming, all the girls go inside. And I'd be like, but I want to see the big masquerade, right? <laughs> but then again, evil culture says, you're a girl, you can't see that. And, but also it was, I think, also knowing very early on that sense of shame. There's a particular shame, I think, that comes with being female. And it's, it's a bodily kind of shame that even when you're, even before, when, before puberty, girls are being told, you know, at the age of eight or seven, cover yourself. You're not sitting properly, close your legs. And when you're a child, you're thinking, what have I done? I mean, there's a sense in which it's, 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 it's an accusation to be told as a little girl. Because um, I remember liking to be comfortable, and so I would sit with my legs open, and I was eight. I mean, I was a child. I didn't have breasts. You know, I was a child. And I remember an aunt of mine saying to me, you said, close your legs, don't sit like that. You know, and, it, and then of course it, it goes on to when puberty comes, and 
you know, your period comes and then the shaming just becomes so much more. You know, I remember the long, first of all, we had to talk about periods in very low voices. We had to whisper and close the door, you know, we can't have any men around. And then you go through a process of what, what do you do to your pads? You wait until nobody's there, then you take them to the back and you, you put them in the garbage, but make sure you put it under and put things on top of it so nobody sees them. <laughs> <laughs> friends who are American, and I was very amused that we <laughs> share this sort of common resentful rage about period pads. I mean, a friend of mine said to me that when she was an undergrad in college, her boyfriend would say to her, oh my god, I don't want to see that. And she said she would then actually go out of her way to hide the pads, and then now she feels this rage that she allowed herself to do that because, you know, this is a normal, natural thing, and do not make me feel ashamed for something that is perfectly natural. But those are the kinds of things that I felt very aware of. And of course also that idea that domestic work was something you had to do. And, and for different reasons. So my mother was relatively progressive. Right? So I grew up in a family that, that wasn't, um, you know, there's nothing repressive about it. Even gender, gender ideas weren't very firmly you know, upheld. But, they were still there. My mother, for example, had my brothers do domestic work. This was not the case in many, many families, where it was always, I mean, the girls did everything, the boys just played football. Um, but boys washed cars, that's the only thing the boys did, yeah. <laughs> the girls did every other thing, cooking and cleaning. My mother had my, my brothers do domestic work, but it was very clear to me that there was a difference in, in the, the reason and the perception. So my brothers did domestic work because, you know, the floor had to be cleaned. I was supposed to do it because that's what you do in a husband's house. And my brothers didn't need to cook, but cooking, we had help. So, you know, it was sort of a life of relative privilege. But my mother would say to me, go to the kitchen and, walk, and stay there while the house helps cook. Because you need to learn how to cook. Because then, you know, you, if you don't, you, if you find a husband, you won't be a good wife. And even then, I remember thinking, I really don't want to be in the kitchen watching them cook. I'd rather be outside playing badminton with my brothers. Um, and so there was, in me, very early on, a kind of just bristling, resentful rage at being excluded. And then, of course, the moment I think about, if I had to pinpoint one of those light bulb moments, I don't think it's necessarily it. I mean, I'm kind of inventing a, a response to your question. <laughs> but it would be... The, the experience I talk about in my TED talk of being in grade three, in my, my teacher, and I remember her very clearly, Mrs. Abo Dikizu. And even the boy I remember, but I wouldn't name him because he's actually a very important person in the world now. <laughs> <laughs> he was, um, this is true, and he's a really lovely guy, really lovely guy. He was, um, so he was in my class, and we both were, you know, there are always the two kids who sort of, in Nigeria, we call it fighting for first. You know, the sort of the two best students in the class. And so my teacher said, I'll give you a test, I'll give a class a test, the best student will be monitor. And we all took the test, and I got the best score, he got the second best. And I thought, I'm monitor. And she said, oh no, no, the monitor has to be a boy, then the assistant monitor has to be a girl. And I thought, but that's not what she said, you know? <laughs> And I remember that so clearly, because I was so struck by the, by how blatant, how overt, how just, it wasn't subtle at all. It was so clear, you cannot be monitored because the monitor has to be a boy. I mean, never mind that the poor guy had, had no interest in being monitored. But this is, I mean, this is nothing we need to, you know, engage with when you're talking about um, male privilege that, you know, some men really don't want to <laughs> be monitored. <laughs> and so maybe we should let whoever wants to be a monitor be monitor. But but I think um, that's I would say that my um, path to feminism, if there's such a thing, that's just never been. And it's also why I didn't read any feminist texts when I was growing up. I like to say that I learned, and I have read some now. It's not my favorite reading, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, I'd rather really just read literature. But I, I learned a lot more about gender by just watching the world. You're just watching. Thank you so much.
So in your prose writing, so you talk about the pressure for girls and women to be likable, mm -hmm. and how this offers an example of what we could say are gender double standards, uh, since boys and men are not expected or told to be naive, so to be likable. And in your recently published book, Dear Ajuele, or Feminist Manifesto and 15 Suggestions, which is based on a letter to your friend, and you provide advice on how to raise a feminist daughter, your eighth suggestion is, quote, teach her to reject likability. Her job is not to make herself likable, her job is to be her full self, a self that is honest and aware of the equal humanity of other people. Many girls spend too much time trying to be nice to people who do them harm. This is the catastrophic consequence of likability. We have a world full of women who are unable to exhale fully because they have for so long been conditioned to fold themselves into shapes to make themselves likable. And I do have a 12-year-old daughter in the audience, so I'd like for her to hear this. <laughs> um, can you say more about how likability shapes girls' and women's experiences and how we can challenge negative socialization in this area? What's her name? Maya. What's mine? It was very cool, Mother. Strongly about it because I think it's it's one of the I think it's lovely to be polite and to be civil. I think everybody should be men and women, but there's something that women and girls are raised to do, which is really to put it crudely, we're encouraged to be false. We're encouraged to be false because we we're, we're socialized to believe that we have to be liked that we need to be liked. I think everyone likes to be liked. Men, women, um, boys, girls. But we don't need to be liked. And I, and I often say to young women that when you pretend and shrink and call back and you know, you're doing things thinking, oh, do they like me, am I likable? Even if they like you, they don't really like you. They like a fake version of you. And I think the world is such a beautiful, diverse place that there will be so many people who like the authentic you. I've talked to many women in positions of power who talk about having difficulty at work, for example, when they have to um, maybe discipline, subordinate. They're thinking, how do I do it in a way that still makes me you know, seem nice? And, and I'm thinking, just do your job, you know? <laughs> I, I don't think men, the majority of men don't spend a lot of time thinking about likability. It also strikes me that you know, think about the, the, the recent campaign in this country, how so much coverage was spent on Hillary Clinton's likability. Oh, you know, who likes her, who doesn't like her, is she likable? And I remember thinking, who the hell cares? <laughs> why? Why? And, and nobody talked about likability with. Yeah! <laughs> Somebody's causing you harm, you tell him. There's <laughs> <laughs> a lot that has to do with the way that we, we've also socialized girls to think about love. I think we, and I think black women in particular, I have to say, are such givers. We were told to give and give. We're not told to take. And we're encouraged, we, the world sort of praises us, lords us, and tells us that our ability to love is in large measure about our ability to sacrifice ourselves. Mm -hmm. we, our, our job as black men is to protect black men. Our job as black 
Job is black women is to 